This is The Secret Library, a podcast about writing and publishing books. I'm Caroline Donahue, a life coach who works with writers, and I'm here to tell you this is your year. It's time to stop waiting and start writing. The Secret Library Podcast is supported by the listener community at the Secret Library Podcast Patreon. You can join the conversation and support the show at patreon.com slash secret library. This is episode 138 of the Secret Library Podcast. My guest today is Lauren Wilkinson, who earned an MFA in fiction and literary translation from Columbia University. She's taught writing at Columbia and the Fashion Institute of Technology. She was a 2013 Center for Fiction Emerging Writers Fellow and has received support from both the McDowell Colony and the Jurassi Resident Artists Program. Her fiction and essays have appeared in or are forthcoming from Granta, The Believer, and The Millions, among other publications. Her first novel, American Spy, is a spring 2019 Barnes & Noble Discover Great New Writers pick. She grew up in New York and lives on the Lower East Side. It was such a treat to talk to Lauren about American Spy and writing in general. I think anyone who has enjoyed conversations on the show where we've gotten a little bit meta will love this episode. I really enjoyed getting into it with Lauren about truth, what it means to explore character, point of view, and to really find the heart of a novel. Also, anyone who has written many drafts of a book in order to find the way it needs to go will be both reassured and inspired by Lauren's perseverance in really figuring out what she wanted American Spy to be. So I'm very, very excited to share this conversation. And here we go with Lauren Wilkinson. Hey, Lauren, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hi, thank you for having me here. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you had me at Spy um, when I was first hearing about the book. So I was really interested in talking to you about that. But the other thing, too, is that there are so many spy books out there. And yours is a really different kind of spy book, which I was very excited about while reading it, if one can call a book a spy book, so to speak. Um the the fact that there is so much more than just the kind of infiltration and the procedural, that this is about relationships, this is as much about the impact on doing that kind of work has on your life and, and what it means to be a woman, a person of color working in this field, all of those things in this topic were all really fascinating to read and satisfying. Thank you. Um, I think really it, that started for me with the character, with the main character. Like I didn't um, want to just plop her down in the middle of a world and not give her a backstory. I wanted it to be important for her to, I wanted the, the relationships in her life um, to be important. I just felt like that was, you know, how I wanted to characterize um, a black woman in the, any novel I was was going to write. So, did you know yeah. that you wanted to write a, a spy novel from the beginning, or did you find her first and then realize she was a spy, or how did it start? Well, it started. It started actually um, in a class uh, by my professor was John Freeman, who was the editor at Grant at the time, and he. It was a class called about suburban. Um, American, you know, middle class fiction. And we read all of these, you know, we read like John Cheever, John Updike, uh, Richard Yates. And, you know, as a prompt, he said, you write something that is the opposite of that <laughs> or undermines these stories that we already know about um, the American suburbs. So for me, the start was like this uh, woman who by all appearances looks like a, you know, typical um, suburban mother, and then something happens in her life that reveals that's not the case. So it kind of started with an image with her being alone in the house and someone has come to, uh, you know, take her out, I guess, and, uh, you know, then moved moved on from there for me. So that remained in the book, that situation. It, it did. It started, um, but in the short story, it's the last scene. And yeah, in the novel, it's the first. Um, starting with a short story was really good for me. I understood like 
where I wanted the story to begin and where and where I wanted it to end. So the book kind of became like a, an expansion of of the novel. But, you know, over the course of writing it, I changed so much about it <laughs> and it ended up. Yeah. The last scene in the um, story is now the first. But yeah. I love that. But yeah, there's there's drafts where it didn't. It's no longer. It's not in it at all. So oh, wow. it really, yeah, it really. Um, I instead of you know writing one version and editing this book, I rewrote it maybe like a half dozen times. So it was a really intensive process for me. Um, I didn't know how to write it another way, but I would not care to do it that same way again. You know, for the next book because <laughs> wow. it was very hard. <laughs> yeah, you rewrote the whole book a half dozen times. Yeah, I kept having this weird like butterfly effect thing happen where I would change something small in the beginning and it would the the changes would really echo. Like a good example is I once made um you know the the main character has a strong relationship with her with her sister and in this draft she's the younger sister but there was one where I made her the older sister uh. and that like really changed um the future I just saw her as very different I saw her as being um someone who really wants to protect people like someone who's very independent and then I kind of I had to like make her older to 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 see those things or to understand those things about her and then you know made her younger again. I don't know. It was, it was, it was weird. It was a, it was a weird, difficult process. I wrote so much that it's just, you know, never going to see the, <laughs> the light of the day, but I got to know this character really well. Um, that's the plus side, but I feel like I have all these things in my head that I know happened to her that have no place, uh, in the book. It's like a, a bunch of little parallel universes where the story went a different way that you've erased, but yet you don't completely forget. Yeah, exactly. That's like a perfect, <laughs> perfect way to think about it, you know, because you, you, I've like made up a person, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm and kind of am weirdly in control of this universe that I made up for her. And yeah, there it kind of just <laughs> echoes out, I guess, in a weird way, in a way I certainly wasn't anticipating when I first started writing the book. That's so interesting. I'm 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 really interested in the point of view of the book as well because I think that's crucial that in a way it reads like first but for the majority of it but it's actually second because the main character is writing sort of in a journal to her sons about the experiences she's had and what's happened to her in her life. And I wondered how was it clear that you wanted that POV from the beginning because that is not an easy one. And how was it to yeah. inhabit a first person point of view with this character through six drafts if you did that many that way? Uh, I, I didn't start out that way. No. And I'll just level with you. It was like a, a trick because of a flaw. Like the story mm. version of this is in third person and she is it's too distant. She's it was like, you know, she's she's a spy. And so. In third person, it was really hard for me to figure out why she would be, you know, spilling her guts because her whole life has been dependent, you know, on not telling secrets. Right. So I made it. Um, so I was like, OK, I wanted to talk to someone, someone she loves so I can kind of get closer and someone that she would be honest with. And the only people, you know, I could think of were, were her children. So it became a letter to them. I, I stole it from um, Marilyn Robinson from Gilead, which <laughs> I love. <laughs> I love that book. It's so beautiful and just so, you know, meditative. And yeah, I just I found that um, just between. Yeah, the that that form was, you know, he's, he's so tender writing to his son. So, yeah, I loved that. That's so cool. Yeah, it is because that is a really tricky thing. And I wouldn't be able to do it. I don't think writing about a spy in third because you'd, you'd have them like sneaking around and they'd be able to shake you so easily. That's what they do. <laughs> yeah. you, you're kind yeah. of the reader following them. They're like, bye, I'm out. You're not going to say anything yeah. about what I really think. <laughs> I don't, exactly. That's that she kept, you know, doing that to me. <laughs> so I was like, okay, let me try to pin this character down. And, and that's how I ended up figuring it out. But definitely by trial and error, you know, it was, um, pretty early on that I was working with like first person or second person, but, um, because I knew that 
it was a problem to have her so distant. I didn't know how to tell her story without getting closer to her. But yeah. <laughs> Is third your, your natural sort of first inclination of a POV to use? Um, you know, I don't think other than, n- I don't, I don't think so. I, I don't mm. think that I have like a preference for, um, first or, or third. Um, I, I feel though that when I write in third, it, I, I, I do, it does feel like there's kind of a, a distance and sometimes like an almost, it can almost be like a little bit of an ironic distance because, you know, mm. just honestly, it's really, um, it can be really embarrassing sometimes to be sincere and honest, you know, on the page. And, and that's, but that's what you kind of need, need to do. Um, so, you know, sometimes when it's like first person or sometimes I would hide behind third person, you know, mm-hmm. but yeah. Um, so, but I, I don't, I don't know. So maybe that inclination to hide makes me more inclined toward third, but you know, I feel like if I want to be, more, I don't, yeah, if I want to be more honest or less, you know, less distancing, then I'll try to use first. Yeah. Yeah. It's just because you said the story was in third. And then as you were writing this story, did you know that you th- would want to turn it into a novel or did you just, it, you couldn't shake it after you wrote it as a story? No, I, I had no idea. I, you know, I wrote a story and uh, I wrote a, you know, my, um, portfolio, whatever, for, for grad school. And I was writing a novel then, and I finished it my first year after, you know, spring semester of my first year. And I was like, well, this is God awful. (laughs) I I realized I was like, there's nothing here, you know, like this is not spent a lot of time on it and this is not good. I, I don't, you know, I had no interest in trying to shop it around. So second year, I felt a little bit lost, um, then happened to have this, you know, got lucky enough to have this prompt that really inspired me. Um, and then, uh, my agent, um, read it in Granta and she was like, do you think you can write a novel? And I had, you know, nothing else going on. And she was an agent I was really wanting to work with. So I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, but no, I wasn't like, it wasn't in my mind. So I'm you know, definitely lucky to have had a couple of outside, um, forces kind of helping me in this, you know, toward this, this goal toward the, in this direction. Yeah. Yeah, she hadn't said that. I don't know. I don't know what I would have done right after, you know, probably kept working on, you know, that the novel that I I, um, threw in the trash was, you know, like kind of I was trying to do like more surreal stuff. They're like talking animals and stuff. And it just really wasn't working for me as a writer. But Mm. I I don't know, I maybe wouldn't have let that go or something. (laughs) I don't know. Well, maybe, you know, maybe with more drafts, there's still something there. Who knows? But I would say you're far away from from talking animals, although Puccini (laughs) does have a really good name. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's like a friend, a good friend of mine. Like he he worked for a woman whose dog was named Puccini. And I've always I've always loved that. (laughs) The the spelling is crucial. Also, it's not P-U-C-C-I-N-I. No, no, no. It is P-O-O-C-H yeah. <laughs> is the first part, which I just thought was adorable. Yeah, I, <laughs> my friend heard me doing that and he was like knew immediately that I'd, I'd borrowed it. <laughs> but I, it's, it was like irresistible to me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, these things are out there in the world. And how can you let them go? They're so good. Yeah. And we can't just yeah. make these up. I mean, you have to no. throw those in. They're like spices. <laughs> Exactly. (laughs) Well, one of the things that jumped out to me about the book as well is that, you know, they're dangling the based on true events element when talking about the book. So I'm wondering about your research process and and how you incorporated kind of what elements are based on true events and, and what was fiction and how did you marry those together? Well, everything about Sankara is, you know, is, is as almost everything is as true as I could make it. I feel like I have a lot of, um, respect for him. So, you know, just to quick, a quick thing, um, Thomas Sankara is a character in my novel based, he's based on a real historical figure, um, who was the Marxist revolutionary president of Burkina Faso up until 1987. Um, and you know, I, 
I felt like a couple of things were really important to try to get him right. And one of those things was to go to Burkina Faso, um, which I did in 2014, to just kind of see if I could understand um, the context in which this person was living and to see how like people were, you know, responding to him um, today. Because I know he's, you know, he's still really beloved and influential figure in the country. So, um I, it was important to me to try to, uh, you know, just n- n- get that, try to be accurate, I guess, and honest um, with some of the major, with most of the major life events. Um, for his dialogue, I uh, used like a couple of, there's a biography that's only in French, which was really dense and difficult for me to read. (laughs) Um, but I tried to use that. There's also a really good archive of his speeches and interviews. And, you know, it was a bit easier to, um, use historical figure that (laughs) is in the world, you know, after like, you know, when, when we really are starting to archive it. So there's like film of him and, you know, interviews about, um, from, of people who knew him. I actually met someone, um, when I was in Burkina who was, uh, you know, he, after the coup that, um, after, yeah, after Blaise Compaore took power, he, uh, you know, he was exiled to Ghana, um, and he was friends with, with Sankara. So, you know, and I, I actually, um, he had like a book of poetry that he'd written in exile immediately after Sankara's death that I got to look at. It was just mm. like really amazing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I tried to, you know, then, but then there are things, um, about his emotional life that I could, only guess at, you know, so he, for me, he's true, but then I've, but then like, you know, Marie is completely fictional. So their interactions, everything about their interactions are, are, are totally, totally fictional. Yeah. That's so interesting too, is to sort of, I find this fascinating to look at history and to kind of look at things that are plausible, but you know that they they didn't necessarily happen because obviously you're making it up. But it's like, well, this I actually this could have happened. You know, it's it if it's coming along with the story, it feels that way. And how was it sort of riding that tension of like, okay, I'm inserting this person into history and and seeing what she does and how it changes things. It was it was interesting and sometimes a little scary, you know, because when someone is so um, beloved as, as, as Sankara is, you know, I don't want to, I don't want anyone to take my interpretation as like a form of disrespect, you know, like, be, um, so that, that, that part was scary, but then in terms of like plausibility, I mean, you know, I kind of just took events that actually we know have happened and then like push them or bent them to, to the, the space and time that I wanted to use them in. But, you know, like there was definitely, you know, Belgium and the CIA are, uh, a lot of people think were behind Lumumba's assassination in the condo in the, uh, in Congo in the sixties. So, you know, I just kind of, uh, shifted things (laughs) over. Um, yeah. And that thing about Sharon Scranton, she was a real person. She was really, uh, you know, she was the victim of a, a honeypot in Ghana in the 80s. So, you know, you kind of just use these real things and then <laughs> fill in the fill in the blanks in the fiction in the way that I um, <laughs> wanted to. Um, I also, I guess, compressed time mm. once. So, uh, you know, he Sankara really did come to New York, but. I gave, you know, in, it was like in 1985, I think I, I made the events a, a lot closer, um, in time from him, you know, there's a, uh, a scene where they're in, um, her world in New York. And then there is a scene where she goes to his world, you know, in Waga and they, yeah, I made those events happen a lot, you know, <laughs> closer, closer in time. Well, I think it's sort of expected in some ways. I mean, this is the beauty of calling something a novel. And I think this is always a question that when you incorporate historical figures, what the responsibility is when you're writing fiction. Because, of course, if every character is fictional, then you feel complete control over the whole situation and like you can do whatever you want. But as you said, like if you include a historical figure, 
it changes, you know, what, what, you know, the handling of the situation. So, yeah. Yeah. And also other people resist it. You know, like I, I was just thinking of a friend who I don't want, I guess I don't want to give too many details, but she, she wrote a book and Mm -hmm. like, um, someone in a review, someone was criticized it because like an event that she wrote didn't actually happen. And I was like, that's not a very, I'm not sure how, what kind of review that is. Like, you know, you, you can not like the book for any number of reasons, but because this didn't happen, it's fiction. It's a novel, you know? Like, so I think there is, uh, there's almost like sometimes different rules when you're using real historical events. Like people want things to be really true <laughs> in a way that they don't generally demand it to be in, in fiction. Um, or sometimes accept it as true. I, I had like a uh, an, another sort of anecdote is like in uh, the Goldfinch Someone was, a friend of mine was telling me that <laughs> someone they knew had read The Goldfinch and was like, oh, I didn't know the the museum had been bombed. It was like, that's, it didn't, ha- yeah, because it didn't happen. That's right. fiction. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, it was not, no, there was no terrorist attack there. Like, I don't, you know, some people, sometimes people lose that, those boundaries, which is interesting to me. Um, and I'm not really sure why. I think it's probably connected, though, to the, to the way that people often ask me what's true you know, in fiction, no matter the nature of the story, uh, you know, like people kind of are are always curious about what's true behind it. Um, I don't know. I don't know why, (laughs) because I think that's the agreement we go into with fiction. You know that I'm I'm telling you a lie. (laughs) Yeah. So I, yeah, but um, people always want to know like what's real behind that lie. And I, I don't, I don't know why, but I do think it's an interesting impulse. And I certainly find myself doing it sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll read something and be like, Oh, where did this person get this idea? Like what is, what in their life inspired, inspired it? (laughs) I think it's a different thing though, to ask that question when you have the experience of writing something yourself. I think that somebody who comes in cold, I just feel like it's a different experience, but I think this is like the big question, you know, what, what is truth with a capital T with regard to fiction and what has Mm. to be true? I mean, I remember, um, hearing Zadie Smith once talking about writing the autograph man versus writing later books. And she said, she went back and looked at it and said, you know, there was this one portion of it and it was a lie. Like, I know it's a novel, but I was dishonest with myself about what I really wanted to say about how the characters felt sort of like what you were Mm -hmm. saying earlier. Like, you know, maybe I don't think she meant she was hiding behind it, but she was like, I held back and I didn't tell the full truth of what the emotional ramifications are. And I was always Mm -hmm. struck with that. Like what are truth and lies with regard to fiction? Yeah, I think that that is so interesting what she was saying. And I think I understand it because I feel that I write fiction so I can be more truthful, you know, like so I can be more more honest about about things. I I I know that's like contradictory, but I, I I feel that I if I was going to write something as nonfiction, I, I would I would um you know, right away, I feel like I'm, I'm so subjective, you know, it's my subjective experience of the thing and that I'm saying, I'm presenting it as objective. It seems a little, you know, doesn't seem as, as true. I don't know. And then there's something too about it being very true, fiction feeling very true to me because of, because of the things that I'm trying to articulate in a book that are not directly on the page, but, you know, like, reactions or emotions that it inspire or ideas that are in, are inspired by what I've written that are experienced by the reader. And like, there's something about being able to express a thought um, or kind of get an idea going in someone else's mind and how they think and how they interpret it without having to like you directly speak those ideas Um it just feels like, I don't know, like it's more, it's more honest. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I really don't know how to say that better. <laughs> no, but, I, I totally get it because I think that in, in the purpose of fiction by contrast is that 
you're able to give people an emotional experience that is impossible for them to have as the person they are in the circumstances that they're in. And to me, that's just as true. And, and it's what points to all those studies that people are always quoting that reading fiction makes you more empathetic or more ability to, uh, you know, have a stronger ability to empathize with people in different circumstances. And to me, that's every bit as important, if not more so in certain cases, than knowing the details of a historical event. Yes, that makes I, sense. I agree very, very much. I, I also, you know, I think also that with fiction, you can transmit the inarticulate <laughs> I, I, I wish that I articulated that word a little better, but yeah, you can kind of things that you have real, one has really difficulty articulating directly. I think you can, a, a writer can put it down and a reader can pick up their interpretation of that inarticulable. I just can't say that word. It's hard. It's a hard, <laughs> inarticulable. Articul- Is that it? Inarticulable thing. Yes. Um, emotion, idea. Uh, yeah. Um, I, you know, I, a couple of people have asked me questions about, um, you know, subtext in, in the book that I've written. They, yeah, you know, that your interpretation is as right as mine. I mean, I definitely was thinking along these lines and, and how you've picked up that thread and are now thinking about this thing is is as true or as right and as honest as the way that I was. And that for me is a very, um, very honestly true thing and a really beautiful thing. You know, I, I yeah, <laughs> I yes. love it. I mean, and that's probably why I, why I have submitted myself to writing six drafts of a, oh, of a book and having some really hard moments with it because of those, you know, just knowing that someone has thought so deeply about something um, that I kind of started with, you know, and having them finish it as finish the thought as they read the book is really, really a special thing for me. So. Absolutely. So May I ask, because I'm fascinated by the six drafts thing as I'm moving between draft two and three of my own book. So I'm like, okay, where are we headed? Um, So did you go like from the beginning to the end each time and play out the entire plot with each draft? Or was it like, okay, you got to a certain point and you were like, ooh, and then you said, okay, I see that she can't be older. So I'm going to go back to the beginning. Or how did these, I'm I'm wanting the nitty gritty, if I may. Um, yeah, no, of course. I mean, I will have to level with you. It was really hard, and I think I blocked some of it. So, Fair like, enough. I mean, it's like childbirth. But, <laughs> yeah, because I certainly would never do it again. Oh, know, my if God. I could, if I could remember the details. But I will. the first thing I want to say is that, you know, I got a lot of really good advice to outline the book. And that was advice that came from people who aren't, aren't writers. And it seems really good on the surface. But for me, like I would out, I would try to outline and then um, I would the thing wouldn't work. <laughs> it just wouldn't you know, it, it doesn't look the same on the page as it does on an out in an outline. So I think what was happening was that I would keep I'm it was almost like. Um, maybe if there was like, if I had like a string and there were like knots in it mm. <laughs> and so you undo a knot and then somehow create two more in the process. Oh God! So it, it was like, it was that kind of like unraveling the narrative, but then occasionally creating, um, uh, in fixing it, cre- creating another problem. And I, um, I think in the, so I would get things that I would want to get right in each draft. I would have them right. And then I would be like, oh, but there are these, there are these problems that have cropped up since then. And then I would just kind of keep writing and be like, okay, well, you can try to figure out a way to resolve that problem in the next version. Just keep moving to try to get the whole thing, um, the whole thing down. Right. (sighs) Yeah. I just... I, I, I was, it was, it was hard. Um, I think, so like the lowest moment for me was, you know, I, I, I wrote a version where I just kind of wrote everything that I could imagine happening to her. Like she 
went on a road trip throughout the United States. Like I was like really off the mark and it was a really long draft. And, you know, I'd worked on it for like eight months and then my agent read it and she's like, this is not, you know, this is not any good. Oh, <laughs> like, this is not, ouch. this is not, you know, this is not. And I knew in the second that she said it, that she was absolutely right. But I just had gone on like a, a tangent, I guess. Um, but then I guess there's something about that, that even though that draft was really off the mark, it kind of opened something up mm. and I made me understand um, what exactly it was, the story, like the story that I wanted to tell about her, because that that's like what it is like, too, where it's almost like I've been following this character around uh, someone with a really interesting life with a video camera from the time that she's, you know, 1962 from the time she's seven, you know, till she's in her mid 30s. And then the trick of writing this novel for me was figuring out which pieces of like of the film that I'm worse I'm supposed to include <laughs> you know it's like filming a documentary and also like editing it um and I, I lost in one of in several of those drafts I lost what it was the story of this person's life that I that I meant to be telling um and then you know had to kind of come back to it I had to remember for example that she was a spy right you know? <laughs> like like she had to do some spying and there was a couple of drafts where she didn't really get into any spy work until like a third of the way in so it was just yeah it was I yeah I because <laughs> it was also like a lot of it was a lot of information that I had at my fingertips right. and and I couldn't figure and I didn't know necessarily what was the story that I wanted to tell? Um, I, and I don't know, I don't know why that was. <laughs> um, well, it sounds like you I, just had too much footage. Yeah, I had, I had way too much footage. I had way too much footage, but that's how I, that's why I know her so well. <laughs> so I don't know how to avoid it. It's like, this is the thing is that Whenever I talk to people and in the process that I'm in as well, it's like, of course, everyone's like, I wish this took about like half as long as it actually took. That would be great yeah. going <laughs> forward if I could pull that off. And at the same time, it, it's like the experience has meant that you know her so well and that the sort of richness of her character really comes through. So I wouldn't give that up, but I certainly understand that it was like, maybe this could have been <laughs> a little faster. That would have felt a little yeah. better. Yeah. It's true. I don't know anyone who's been like, oh, yes, I wrote my book very efficiently. <laughs> like everyone. Right. And, and to the also like people think it's wrong that they're doing something wrong because it feels so inefficient. And I'm like, no, that's just like how it is, I guess. Like that's built into it. You you always will have too much footage. You can't put all the you can't put it all in. And you kind of have to sometimes you have to like write a scene and only once you get to the end of it, do you realize that it doesn't belong in what you've written, <laughs> that oh, it really yeah. has no place. Um, it's brutal. Yeah, so it is brutal. <laughs> Writing fiction is pretty brutal. It's probably the most inefficient thing there is. I mean, I don't I know agree. anything <laughs> else except for maybe like map making in like the 1700s or something. It feels like that. Yeah. You just have to wander around in the landscape and then you're like, oh yeah, that's where that river goes. Okay. Yeah. But it's yeah. like, you can't fly over top of it and see it as much as you want to when you're doing no. it. No. And I think that's how like an outline functions. So this idea that you can fly over the top of it, but you can't, you kind of have to be there, you know, in on the actual terrain, figuring it out. And just by virtue of that, like it is really inefficient and very difficult and you get lost <laughs> a lot. I mean, I got, I certainly got lost a lot. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's, I think it's unavoidable. So with regard to the drafts where, where there was no spying, I'm interested in how, how did you research the spying? Cause the spying feels really legit. So I'm interested in how you did that because it just sounds like fun to be able to research spying rather in depth as part of yeah. writing. <laughs> I was interested in, um, uh, the spies. I don't know. I, it's just, it was, it was a very interesting part. I read, um, a couple of books. I read, uh, Lindsay Moran's book. Uh, she is a CIA agent. Um, it was set in 2003, but I kind of, or, you know, she was an agent around in the early 2000s, but 
I figured, you know, probably not that much <laughs> has changed. I mean, it was, yeah. it was sexist in 2000. So I'm sure in the so 80s, it, wasn't it better was in far the 80s. worse. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and that was really, that was really good. I really liked reading her, her memoir. Um, and then, you know, I read uh, like a lot of nonfiction about the FBI that was published around this time. I read this book called the FBI by Ronald Kessler. Um, that was <laughs> like, you know, in, it was published in like 89 or 90 and he'd gone to all these places and, you know, he'd gone to Quantico and he'd like spoken to agents and it was interesting to get like a taste of how he talked and like how that is just not, you know, <laughs> appropriate now. Like, you know, every <laughs> woman who walks, you know, in, he like gives like a, appraisal of her looks you know like oh, every God. female agent and it's just like this is not necessary you know like I don't um and I just kind of followed that thread and made some guesses at how you know if that's how someone writing about this would be like who, how actually it would be to be an agent in this in this world <laughs> um yeah I mean I also read a lot of spy fiction because you know I wanted to try to understand the genre as well as I could. Um, so John le Carre and Graham Greene, um, William Boyd, who wrote this book called Restless, which is about, um, a female spy. Um, yeah, it was, it was good. You know, sometimes I was just like, oh, I can't, I can't write anymore. <laughs> I just read something and, you know, it would kind of get my imagination going so I could start again. Yeah. It's, I love, cause I mean, on the one hand, it's like, I would, I would have been really excited to hear that you were like, you know what I'm taking on the spy genre, but I love it even more that it was just, okay, what's the opposite of a normal suburban experience <laughs> and yeah. that it just goes like, okay, we're going spy with it because that's true. I mean, and, and we yeah. have that fascination with like, who are the people next door? What are they thinking? You know, I mean, you think of the show, The Americans, that's just wrapped and that whole phenomenon from the 80s of like, are there Russians next door? And this whole, <laughs> this whole fascination that we have, but yet to put it in a literary context is so, uh, again, it's, I keep using the word satisfying to describe your book. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, it really started, you know, I joked in the beginning, like, oh, this kind of started as a metaphor. And then I had to like play catch up and be like, oh, okay, you know, actually now I have to figure out how to make her literally a spy. Because <laughs> like, I was pretty focused on you know, just, oh, like a spy, like racial politics, you know, <laughs> racial yeah. identity. Like, um, but then I was like, oh, wait, no, if she's going to be a spy, I have to figure that part out and, and try to do as good a job as I, as I can, you know, and take it seriously. So, well, I think this is the challenge too, is that, um, there's, there's uh, this question of sort of having to be invisible and what being invisible means. And so she's trying to bring her experience. So she's got this sort of, she's not being taken seriously as a woman or as a woman of color. And then also spies are supposed to be invisible. So, so the thought of bringing to light all of these things through a book is a huge challenge, but I think a really important one. Thank you. I, I, um, yeah, I, I did feel a couple of times when I was like, oh, I'm just I'm in over my head. <laughs> like there are these things that I would love to write. I think sometimes and this probably happens with every writer where it's like, oh, you know what? I wish I had I wish I'd written this maybe later in my life, like or maybe when I was like a like, I, you know, better <laughs> writer. Like I but it's also funny because when you you know, you write this project for so long, you start, it took me like six years to write this. And, you know, if I were to write this exact same story today, it would probably be completely different because like the DNA was like from six years ago, the writer that I was six years ago was the, the germ of the story. And just by virtue of writing almost every day for six years, I'm a completely, I, I think in a really different way, <laughs> you know? So there's also that thing that about writing a novel that's very frustrating or it's just you know time <laughs> essentially yeah. in the way that it's not necessarily working working with you <laughs> but at the um, same time I think who you know who you were six years ago had this wish of like I wish I had written this when I was better but by the end of writing it for six years you are better like you've become that writer you wished you were 
Yeah, I, I guess maybe I've become that writer, but the idea that I started with has hasn't really changed. I don't know. I mean, (laughs) sorry if that's kind of maybe I don't mean to be cynical (laughs) or but it's just it's it's harder. It's it's just I just it's hard to write a book for reasons that are, um, you know, emotional (laughs) as much as just pure discipline and writing every day. I mean, that really was where I was where I struggled was just, you know, (sighs) just feeling <laughs> like you really putting yourself so much of yourself into something. It's so intimate, <laughs> you know, like just, it's such a intimate expression of, of who I am, even if it's fiction, you know? Um, and that's hard. It's hard for that to also be in the world now. And I don't have any control over how people interpret it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of things about, um, writing fiction that, you know, I'm def- I'm learning and I'm excited about, and also, you know, a little frightened about if I'm, if I'm honest, but very, you know, very happy of course too, because this has been, has been my dream to, you know, I've, I've wanted to write a book ever since I was a little kid and that's because I loved reading them so much, you know? So I was definitely that kid where you just gave me a bunch of books and just left me alone and I could keep myself entertained for, for hours. So, yeah, I, I think that that's, yeah, I think that that's a beautiful thing to have that intention and then to have it, you know, to have it come up and meet you. And then that you work so hard for it. And then you think, oh, one day I could do this. And then you do. I think that's amazing. It's exciting. It's exciting. But, you know, so it means so much to me. Yeah, so much is for me, a lot is on on the line. And yeah, it's 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 scary to it's scary in the way that it's always kind of scary to be vulnerable. So, yeah. And so now everyone gets to read it. (laughs) <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure they're going to love it though. It's so good. So the people the people who get it are going to be the ones that count, I think. That's my yeah. theory anyway. That's what I'm that's what I'm telling myself right now. Yeah. I think we can stick with that response because um I think when you work so hard on something that long, it's also like the benefit can't be taken away no matter what. But the side benefit is it's a really good book. So I think I think all of it wins. Good. That's, that's good. I, this is, you have a good, uh, it's good to talk to you (laughs) because this is, yeah, this is like a good way to look at it. Um, it helps me just to be reminded of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's such a treat talking to you. It was a treat reading your book and I'm, I'm glad you persevered through all those drafts so that we get to have it. And I hope that you will persevere. I hope that you're keeping it going. I'm keeping it going. (laughs) It's coming along. It's coming along. Good. I'm inspired by your, by your stories, your tales from the future. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Secret Library Podcast. The show is produced by me, Caroline Donahue, and Frederick Barry McWilliams Jr., my tireless audio engineer. To get show notes for this episode and all other episodes, please visit secretlibrarypodcast.com. To get updates, literary love, and notification when new episodes are posted, sign up there for Footnotes, my newsletter. And to learn about life coaching with me to work on building your writing life, visit carolinedonahue.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. Gold stars to everybody who leaves a rating and review on iTunes. We're so grateful. Until next time, happy reading.